<laughs> Good morning. The word for woods crossed. The word for the world. Actually, the word for everyone. You know, what's interesting to me is that people say, well, how do you know that Jesus is coming? And I pretty bluntly answer them straight up. I say, because he said so. And they say, but haven't you always been saying that? I said, well, yes and no. Because you see, anyone could die at any time. And everyone in the early founding fathers or in Christianity used to know that you could die any day, that you were only given a certain amount of time and then once your time was up, poof, you were gone. It's only in recent days that in modern Christianity that people have gotten this attitude or this idea that somehow they can just live forever. You know, that they're going to keep on being healthy or they're going to keep on being wealthy. That they're going to keep on being wise or that they've got all of it in a nice little package that no, God can't do this or God won't do that. But first he's going to warn people by his prophets. He's going to warn people by his word. I got news for you. He's already done that. <laughs> the biggest sign of his coming was the birth of Israel. Now, after that, there are certain signs of his coming that you can look for and you can see. When Jesus was ascending into heaven, the angel said to his disciples, why do you stand here looking for Jesus, you know, return? Do you not know that he shall return in the same way that he left? And so I, I find that interesting because generally speaking, Jesus was here for about three and a half years. Now, that's an interesting time span because that three and a half years of his ministry was an interesting kind of like warning maybe, you know, like, well, you know, three and a half years is kind of an interesting number because, you know, we talk about the Great Tribulation and the first part of it is like three and a half years of peace. The last part of it is three and a half years of wrath poured out upon anyone living. So that means if the church is here on earth, some of it, then guess what? Some of it's going through great tribulation. So the people that like to play with this wrath game, you know, they try to say, well, you know, God didn't apportion us to wrath, so we're not going to be here. So everybody's going. Well, no, not everybody's going. Some people aren't knowing what they should be knowing, so they aren't going. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> you know, you're supposed to Pray to be counted worthy. And Jesus said something interesting in the letters to seven churches. To about six of them, he said, you do them wonderful, but I got news for you. You need to overcome. Oh, okay. And so if they read the letters to the seven churches, they kind of got the idea that, well, they're the ones that need to overcome. I don't. I'm one of the ones that's in that one church, you know, that Jesus was talking to that, oh, I'm so full of love, I'm so full of mercy, I love my enemies, I'm turning the other cheek, I'm forgiving everyone, I'm worthy to be counted a crude unto God rescuing me out of the world. Oh, so I'm going to go because after all, I know. Good luck with that one. Paul warned the church and said, pray to be counted worthy, not that you were worthy. Pray to be counted worthy. And he said, I work hard on being counted worthy, lest I be at the end of my race cast aside as one who did not finish his course. So I find it kind of like, yeah, you know, when somebody famous gets up and says, hey, you know, Jesus isn't coming yet because we didn't see the red moon in the sky. Well, guess what? It ain't by red moons. I'm sorry. Jesus is called the bright and shining morning star. He's called the evening star too, but he's called the morning star. And right now, about this time of year, if you've seen the morning star, you're going, whoa, wake up call. If you've seen the evening star, you're going, whoa, wake up call. If you've read the word of God, you know that Jesus said, prepare, get ready. If the thief or if the master of the house knew when the thief would return, then he would prepare himself. Now, I find it interesting this time of year it's kind of like a springtime. It's kind of like when the shepherds would be out tending their sheep. It's kind of like when people would be doing their own thing. They'd be getting ready for their summer fun. 
they'd be doing all these other activities. And right before dawn, you know, the earliest part of the pre-dawn when it's still dark, if you look to the east, you'll see the brightest star that you've ever seen in your life. You'll be amazed at what the angle of the earth at its equinox at this point in time does to the morning star. Oh, have you heard that expression before? Let me clarify something. The bright and shiny morning star is shining brighter than it ever does right now. Ooh, could that be a sign? Well, you know, it'd be kind of like a blind man would have to be blind in order to not see if he were standing here where I was in the dark watching the bright and shining morning star rise up over the Wasatch Mountain Range. Matter of fact, it's so bright you go, oh my God. And you'd be wondering, you know, is today the day? That's how bright it is. So I find it interesting when people like Billy Graham's daughter, you know, uh, someone lots, I can't remember her name, is talking about Jesus is coming in this generation. I find it fascinating that other people will talk about Jesus coming, but they won't say the bluntness of it that we know as a fact, you know, of when he will return to this generation. Like Mike McIntosh asking her to speak at his church and then backing her up by making the statement that this generation that saw the birth of Israel will see Jesus return. I'm fascinated because, you know, I see a lot of, uh, you know, Mike McIntosh is a Calvary Chapel pastor. I see a lot of Calvary Chapel pastors will mention it in passing. They'll mention it in kind of like, well, yeah, you know, maybe, you know, well, it could happen anytime, but, you know, maybe not today, but maybe down the road. You know, and teach people, you know, well, you got plenty of time. You don't need to get out of debt. You don't need to prepare yourself. You don't need to, you know, like consider your ways, forgive people, um, have no one hold things against you of some type, but rather, you know, make yourself at peace with most all men if it at all means possible to reconcile yourself with your brother, to go and do the things Jesus said, in other words. But Mike is saying that. And Mike's been saying that for a long time. And you know, I find it interesting that that's the same thing that I was taught. You need to, if you've got things going on and you're fighting battles and you're arguing and debating and you're wrapped up in this world, i got news for you. You better get ready. Jesus is coming. And if you're still playing around with burying the dead, you know, taking care of your kids and family and job and all these things, you know, and, and tied up, that means you're tied down. And if you're tied down, guess what? You ain't going nowhere, buddy. <laughs> you're hanging on because you're hanging around. That's why. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with going into great tribulation. I wouldn't want to be there. But, hey, if you're prepared for and you're doing those things to get ready for God sending you into great tribulation, and he will, because in the letters to the seven churches, it was obvious, he said to a few of them, you are going, and you will suffer, and this is how you will die. Now, I know that's not the kind of message you think Jesus would say, but Jesus said it. As a matter of fact, he kind of told all his disciples that they would suffer persecution. He told all of his disciples that it's possible you would die, and you would have to overcome for your faith. Now, that's not a popular American Christian idea. The American Christian idea is that I get my job, I get my car, I get my house, I get my kids, I get my wife, I get my job, and I get to, you know, go to church on Sunday, you know, and, and kind of play the game until, you know, it's finally time to go away and graduate into something bigger and better for me. Because it's all about me. Well, there's going to be an interesting development the day after the rapture. Because, quite frankly, I'm pretty sure, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that one of the biggest wake-up calls for America will be the rapture. And that's just one of the things that I don't have a problem saying to anyone in the entire world, because Jesus said two should be in the field. One would be taken. Even if I said that it was a 50-50 chance for you, that's not good odds. That's like flipping a coin and saying, guess what? Which way? Heads or tails? That's what 50-50 means. That's what Jesus was saying. Look, it's not that kind of like an assurance you get to tell God or you get to think God said 
oh, everybody goes. No. It's not one of those things where you can say, well, I'm going to deny hell and admit heaven so that I can say, well, grace is going to cover me because after all, Jesus said I'd be saved. Well, yeah, you will be, you know, one way or another, either snatched away or go through the day. You know, the day of after the rapture, do you still believe? Or did you only believe because you got what you wanted? when you wanted it. In other words, you had your cake and ate it too right now in this life, but you weren't willing to pay the price through overcoming and loving not your life even unto death. Being a witness and example of a believer, being that type of person that would realize, oh, I am living in the last days because I know they disappear, even though they may have some kind of excuse. I doubt it. Because you see, even when there's an excuse put out by the government today, nobody believes it. They always argue about it. So if they don't believe the political answers, what makes you think they're going to believe the spiritual answers? Some people wait, want, and will get from the Lord our God the answer to their prayers. They are always looking for the Antichrist. They say, well, I'll believe when I see the Antichrist. Well, okay, then you're going to see him. And you will be in the Great Tribulation. Sorry, that's the way it worked. God gave you what you wanted. Matter of fact, there's a lot of examples in the Old Testament of kings saying things and not realizing out of their own mouth. They gave God their request. And God honored what they stated. And God did for them. And they didn't like it. Because... They knew they had said it, but unfortunately, they had to live it. One king wanted to live longer and found out that wasn't such a good idea. One king said he wanted to see the salvation, and he saw the salvation of the Lord, but he didn't get to enjoy it. Another one wanted some other thing, and God did it, but unfortunately, they weren't part of it. So, the heart, the attitude, the actions, God sees. God sees in here, you know, and you can kind of like open up your shirt, you know, and look inside and go, well, what's he see? Well, that's not what he's looking at. He's looking at what you don't know up here and what you don't know in here. He's been looking at you and saying, hey, get ready. Jesus is coming. I have warned you over and over and over again. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Heal the sick, raise the dead, freely you receive, freely give. Now, you might be one of those, you know, like, well, I've got to earn a living in my Christian ministry. Okay. Or, well, you know, I've got my little Sunday thing going or my Wednesday thing going or whatever it may be. Okay. But what did Jesus say? You know, I mean, what is he telling you to do? I mean, you can tell me that, you know, Jesus said, well, I'm, I'm supposed to be a better father. Okay. I'm supposed to be a better mother. Okay. I'm supposed to be a better worker at my job. I'm supposed to be a better football player. I'm supposed to be a better professional athlete paid Googles of money. And I do donate some of it, you know, after all, to worthy causes. Okay. But the fact of what God is talking about is what has he told you today to do? Because the scripture says today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation. The reason why we have the word for Wood's Cross is because we have a word for you today. It comes directly out of the word of God. It is the word of God. There's no commentary added to it. There's no differentiation of opinions. It is the stated Bible's word of God that if you have ears to hear what the spirit of God would say to you, he is speaking to you and he will direct you today because he promised that in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, if we would trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning not, now remember this, leaning not in our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging Him, He would direct our path. That means every day, like today, if you wake up and you saw that bright morning star, you'd be asking God, what do you want me to do today? Do you really want me to go to work? Do you really want me to do something else? Or should I get on my knees and pray, God, what do you want me to do? And God, forgive me today. Because that's where you should start. No matter what you do, where you go, or how you arrange your day, you ought to be on your knees praying every day. First of all, thank God for one more day alive, and then second, thank God your mercy and your grace endures forever. 
all through the Psalms we're told that Israel says these words. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever because Israel knew what a sinner they were. Israel knew how bad they had blown it. Israel was very aware of how screwed up they were. Aren't you? Or are you? Do you think you're perfect? I don't. I mean, one of the things about this ministry that I've said from day one, I said, you know, you leave me alone five minutes and I'll dive in that pool of sin and I'll swim around and enjoy it. So I pray God keeps a rain on me. He reins me in. He holds me with a bit in my mouth and blinders on the sides of my eyes so that I would focus in on the prize that's right before me and I would run the race with endurance, going even the faster and harder the last mile. Because I got news for you. You got less than five years, if that. I would say you probably got less than five minutes, but hey, you know, I don't want to push your buttons, you know, and then have you go after five minutes. Well, it's been five minutes. Where was he? Dare I say for somebody, maybe they died in those five minutes. There he was. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Some of you that live in violent areas, you know, your, your country's torn apart by war and savaged by terrorists. And you know that, you know, death is knocking all the time at your door and that it could take you in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You'll be gone. Stray bullet drone strike and you happen to be one of those innocent bystanders that nobody keeps track of anymore, especially Americans. You know, well, well, we, we got our target and we killed our 50 group. How many people did you get with it? Well, 50 group. How many people did you kill with it? Well, 15 others. Oh, were they all terrorists? Well, you know, we try to limit the number of innocent people that die when we go and use our drone strikes. You know, like war. How many extra people die besides the enemy, you know, and we just had Memorial Day where we're saying, oh, thank you soldiers for going to war for us and protecting our freedoms. So how many innocent people did you kill along the way? Whoa. Oh, you didn't kill any innocent people. You are just following orders. They weren't innocent. They were part of the problem. Whoa, yeah, yeah. We were there to educate the nation. Whoa, yeah, yeah. We freed up certain people. Whoa, yeah. I got the excuses, but I don't have the reason. Jesus said, love your enemies. Show me where in any place else it says to kill them and I'll, I'll go with you. But it doesn't. Anyone. Not one. Well, you know, evil will flourish if good men do nothing. Oh, show me the scripture for that one. You know, I'll be perfectly honest. You know, Jesus said, hey, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Up until now. And the fact of the matter is, is that the kingdom is not of this world. So if you think that somehow protecting your little you know, bubble of whatever may be your country or your nation or your home or your city is what God is all about man you're gonna die and when you die it's all gone for you you're going to stand in heaven and have an eternity forever where you won't even remember this and it'll be passing away as though it were the grass that faded and withered away instantly so eternal values Eternity is knocking at your door, always. Trying to get you to open up and ask Jesus in so that you would spend the rest of eternity with him, ages to ages in a never-ending succession of life. Constantly going through a development of learning what God is, who God is, and how God operates. People say to me all the time, God can't do something, and I say, really? What kind of God do you serve? Because I have no problem knowing that when God said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, after that he can do anything. Well, God won't do. Really? Show me where it says God won't do. Well, God doesn't do, except that he revealed first to us. No, that's a privilege of choice of his that he might show you. But guess what? He's already shown you in Genesis 1 by saying in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. After that, good luck. I'm trying to deny that he told you. He can do anything. He's the creator. One of the things that Jesus kept saying, I want you to know the Father because he does love you. But I want you to know the Father because he is God. And he is the creator of the universe. Now, Jesus was there as God. And we like to, whenever we want something from God, we like to point to Jesus and go, oh, yeah, we want him. But nobody likes to deal with the, ooh, holy Father the God that we think is the one that's mean and Jesus is nice and you know somewhere the Holy Spirit in between is everything you know that we want 
sugar daddies. No, the fact is they're the same, yesterday, today, and forever. The love was there in creation, the love is there at the end with recreation. The wrath that you say God can't pour out is still the same as it's the wrath that's going to be poured out upon the world. And anyone under that wrath is going to receive it and they're going to be spared the going through longer than what they need to go through unless God says you're supposed to go through as a witness or a testimony. You see, part of it is man playing God and telling God what he can't do as opposed to we admitting we're not God and God can do anything he wants to do. So, if you get up before sunrise and it's dark and you want to see something that will change your heart and you want to see something that will remind you that Jesus is coming again, go look in the east. Watch for it. Because if it's still dark and there's no stars in the sky, you're going to see the bright shining morning star just light up with fire in the morning. And it's going to give you kind of a goosey bumpy feeling. I'm telling you. And I don't mean necessarily the Holy Spirit coming down upon you. It may be God giving you some wisdom about the fear of the Lord <laughs> is the beginning of wisdom. And you kind of go, ooh, ooh, ah, I think Jesus is coming soon. You may think it, some of us know it. We look for the Savior. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, we should live righteously, and we should live godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous for good works. We, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Jesus was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Are you looking for his coming, or are you looking for his delay? Most Christians I know today, I can tell them, you know, look, you've got less than five years. Your grandchildren aren't going to grow up and they will rebuke me. I will tell them, look, you've got less than, even if I said 10 years, <coughs> and your 401k will never mature, they will rebuke me. You can't say that. I can. I can tell you flat out, you're not going to get old. I mean, relatively speaking. In other words, you're not gonna get it much older than what you are, but you know, I've always known that sometime after you know the end of the Mayan calendar fallacy, sometime after all these different weird ideas that people had, that, you know, I personally believed that as soon as Billy Graham and Chuck Smith, you know, these older guys that were around before Israel became a nation, actually died, Jesus would return. Known that all my life. I've been teaching that most of my life. I'll admit the first few years, maybe first five years of studying prophecy, I didn't really say that. And that was back in like maybe from 1974 to 79. About 1980, you know, not 88 reasons for the Lord's coming in 1988 or whatever. So I, I never read that book. I don't even know what it is. But apparently, Chuck, I guess, and some of these other ministries got caught up in something because all of a sudden, you know, you didn't see the big banners that, you know, Calvary's used to have about Jesus is coming soon or teaching it as a primacy of the efficacy of the dominance of what most of us Jesus people were about. I was gone in Alaska, so I don't know what happened for sure or why there was a shifting. You know, according to some prophecy sites, you know, they were busting Chuck for making some kind of statement about the Lord's returning. Well, I listened to what their evidence was and I said, well, frankly, I'm still believing what he said right now, today, you know, whatever amount of years later, 1980s to today, I guess it's 24 years later or something, you know. 
So, maybe 34? <laughs> so, I don't have a problem telling you that from the moment I got saved, I kind of knew how many years I had to go, sort of. But praying and studying all these years, yeah, I've been studying prophecy for, oh, I don't know, maybe... I quit studying it as just a primacy study and teaching people about the rapture and, you know, all the different, what people call today partial rapture, and I just say, it's not partial. Those are the ones that are supposed to go. Sorry, you know, it doesn't mean everyone's going. It just means that's what Jesus said. You know, if the Bible's pretty blunt and obvious, you know, people wanted to know, like, when and how and why. I just, you know, used to study and share things with people, and then the Lord said, you know, you need to focus in on this part, you know, so I started focusing on something else, you know, started teaching that. But when I was still a prophecy scholar teaching that specifically, you know, and only quit about five years ago, I guess there's probably about 30 years worth of studies in, you know, constantly studying, finding the false teachings like this stupid red moon thing, you know, never fell for that, you know, Hagee's idea, you know, they picked up from Blitz, you know, and some messianic guy messing around with people, you know, screwing up their head because they didn't do their research. The red moon was explained in the book of Revelation farther on. I mean, it was pretty simple. I said, well, you know, people ask me and I told them, you know, this is why it's false, you know. Or like the Harbringer, another messianic trying to warn you about something that he doesn't really believe in. But he'll sell it to you. He'll sell you the book so that he can get his money for his ministry. Both guys needed the money. You look at what the cause and effect is of their ministry and you see, hey, look, if you took away the money, they wouldn't be teaching it. Would they? And did they before they made money off it? You see, a lot of this stuff is about money and making money because they gotta hype you to get you excited about what you could find out freely, the Word of God. So, I'm telling you, you can do something to prove to yourself about whether Jesus is returning soon or not. Wake up before dawn, look to the east, like one of the three wise men, watch for that star, you will see it, you won't have any problem with it this time of year, brighter than everything else that you could see in the sky. And then ask Jesus, are you coming back like you know, in my generation? Or, gee, Lord, are you coming back like now? Are you coming back in less than five years? You do it. I've done it. I was wanted to know because, quite frankly, I wanted to know how much I could get away with. You know, I mean, I'm like you. I wanted to know, well, can I have a wife? Can I have kids? Can I have a car? Can I have a job? Can I, can I do all these other things in the world and be worldly for a while and then become spiritual? I'm the only one that's going to admit that, but, you know, I mean, there's a lot of carnal Calvary pastors and other pastors, vineyard pastors and other kinds of pastors that won't admit that, but I know that's what they did, you know, what they do and some of what them still to this day, why they deny or don't teach on the Lord's coming. Well, when we get to that part in scripture, we'll talk about it. Yeah, it's the primacy of the efficacy of the, you know, imminency of his return, so we use it as a doctrine to kind of get people into church. Yeah, that's what you do. You manipulate the word so that, you know, you can use it for your personal reason. But I got news for you about the imminency of his return. He didn't tell all the wise men, quite frankly, look up in the sky. He didn't tell all the Jews in Israel, look up in the sky. Matter of fact, boom, when it happened, there weren't everybody looking for his return. They knew sometime around this time of year, you know, sometime around this these years, Something's got to happen because it can't keep going on like this. That's what Jewish people knew. Jewish sages, they could have known and they said they did know where he was going to be born, but they kind of denied it and passed it off because after all, right now we, we have more important things to do. We're under Roman rule. You know, kind of like people argue about, well, right now, you know, we got a president to take care of. You know, we got we to argue about these issues, you know, that first. Then we can deal with, you know, whether Jesus is coming back. And we'll tell you what the truth is. Well, you know, I can tell you what the truth is. You're going to go into great tribulation. Hello? Because you just read those that look for his coming. Are you looking? Are you watching? Are you waiting? Are you ready? If not, then you need to get ready. Like I said, you, may, you might have a year or two, maybe. That's about, around, about, about enough time to figure out if you haven't forgiven someone, you need to go forgive them. If you have bitterness, you know, kind of anger, you have time to deal with it and to be forgiven and to kind of work on it. Because really, if you're working on it, God will use His grace and kind of like yank you out of this place. 
But if you're not even thinking about it, and you're not even looking for his coming, and you're not even knowing that he's coming soon, and not even preparing yourself at all, you're not going. That's a blunt truth. It's a fact, Jack. And I don't care how much you want to, you know, pick some popular Bible teacher to tell you that you get to go because you believe it. Good luck. Because it's his mercy and his grace that saves us. And that mercy and grace will be extended to you in the Great Tribulation. But you'll do something for that. According to what Jesus said in the letters to seven churches, you'll die. Because they love their life not even unto, they love not their life even unto death. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. So you have something to do. The blood of the Lamb, word of his testimony, and loving not your life even unto death. Because you get to do one of the two. You either live for him now or you die for him later. Pretty simple. Chuck used to say it that way. If you can't live for him now, how are you going to die for him later? Well, you know, you know, he used to say a pretty hardcore, and you know, if you're you know, one of those hardcore extremists that you like, you know, living on the edge, good luck. That's probably what you're going to do. But I would say to you today, wake up and look at that star. Spend a few moments, you know, praying, you know, and thinking, considering your ways. Talk to God and see if he doesn't talk back to you and warn you. Because the Spirit of God is having less and less effect on people, on the world, and he's not holding back as much as he used to. And so it's time for you to realize, if you ain't got enough oil, you better be getting some oil, which is really the peace, the love, the joy. The meekness, the kindness, the temperance, the gentleness, the word of God that teaches you that no, you shouldn't be going out there and killing people. No, you should not be going out there and getting mad at people. No, you should be not going out there and arguing with people. You should be going out and telling people Jesus is coming. And if you aren't, well, you know, go out there and teach people that Jesus is alive or God is not dead and that you are learning and growing. But if you're just kind of like going along with the, you know, smooth sailing, you know, well, we're going to pretend like the American church knows what they're doing and that, you know, we need to be in politics this next coming years. And we need to get involved in these social causes and we need to, you know, like, fight this care or that care or anything. I have news for you. It's not what Jesus said. He never once said, you know, work out, you know, um, your salvation of the nation. You know, he never said he was going to save the nation. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Seek him and follow him. That's it. Pretty sure, pure and simple. He will tell you what to do. James 1 5 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who braideth not, but giveth to all men liberally. The wisdom is made manifest through the word of God. The Sermon on the Mount teaches you very bluntly how to live. Love your enemies. Get out of what you're doing. Quit being in debt. Get out of debt. Don't go buy something new. Don't go get invested. Divest yourself. Be smaller. Focus in on people that are important to you that you want to make sure they understand there's no time left. People get ready. Jesus is coming. Soon we'll be going home. Some of you sooner than later. Some of you later than sooner. And as far as me, I have no idea which I will be. So don't think that I'm all confident about my place. I only know that whether I go sooner or whether I go later, I go with the Lord. And whatsoever the Lord wants to do, I'm content with what he will do with me. So, God bless you today. I hope you think about Jesus' return. Because if you don't, you may be left behind when you could have been taken in time.